I want to uh, welcome all of you, including those who are joining us uh, on the live stream through the internet. My name is Richard Snyder. I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. And I want to welcome you to a teach-in on Mexico's missing students. This is a timely and important opportunity for reflection and discussion about the tragic disappearance of 43 Mexican students in Ayotzinapa, located in the southern Mexican state of Guerrero, and also to think about the implications of this for Mexico, for U.S.-Mexican relations, and for all concerned citizens across the world. I want to say something briefly about the origins of this teaching. And then before I introduce our panelists, we have four panelists here today, we're going to present to you a short five-minute video that will give you some important background information about the event today and the events in Mexico. Okay, so the origins of this event, the most important thing for me to say is that this grew out of a student initiative. Three Brown students from Mexico, Alejandro Bertis, and two of our panelists, Paula Martinez and Camila Ruiz, came to see me in my capacity as director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. And they said, we have to do something about this, about the disappearance of the Mexican students. Um, Paula and, and Camila, who are on the panel, um, had recently published a co-authored piece, a very good piece, in the journal, The Brown Political Review, um, entitled Ayotzinapa, Exposing the Fallacy of the Mexican Moment. And I want to thank both of them and also Alejandro Bertiz for bringing this initiative to us. As I said, before introducing the panelists, we're going to be showing a short five-minute video entitled Mexico, the Wound of the World. And this will give you some important contextual and background information about the disappearance of the students and also about the broader problem and ongoing problem of violence in Mexico today. The video, I want to point out, was produced by a transnational civil society network, which is called Global Forum. And in fact, this teaching event is part of a series of events that are taking place in universities across the globe to help inform the public about Mexico's political situation, as well as to promote dialogue and citizen participation. And if you want to learn more about these other events and the Global Forum Network, you can go to hashtag, then it's one word, Global Forum Ayotzinapa. Also, before the video, I want to call your attention to another event that we're holding tomorrow here at Brown University that's connected to this one. On the main green of our campus here at Brown, we're going to have a memorial exhibit. And the exhibit on the green here at Brown to commemorate, to remember the, the missing students. And we want to ask all of you to pass by the exhibit, take a moment to remember the students. And also, you can become a voice for those who are silenced. And you can do this by showing your support for this by taking a picture and then sharing it on social media, a picture of the memorial exhibit tomorrow. And I also want to acknowledge uh, at this moment another Brown student, uh, Silvina Hernandez, who's a sophomore here at Brown from Oaxaca and California. And she took the initiative to organize the memorial exhibit for tomorrow. OK. We're going to turn to the video. One last thing. Those of you who are watching via live stream, I'm not sure you're going to, you're going to be able to watch the five-minute video and hear it. Um, however, you can watch it on YouTube. And you can go to YouTube, and the link for that is on the Facebook site for this event, which is hashtag Ayotzinapa, colon, a teach-in on Mexico's missing students, for those of you joining us by live streaming, OK? And if you can't watch it now, you can watch it later on YouTube. OK, let's turn to the short video. Camila, can you help me get this on? 
Do we want to turn the lights, uh, dim the lights if we can, or is that too complicated? Eight years ago, the president of Mexico, facing a highly contested election, decided to declare a war on drugs. To do this, he called the military to the streets. The results were that Mexico went from having 9,900 murders per year in 2005 to 23,000 in 2013. On December 2012, Enrique Peña Nieto from the PRI, the Institutional Revolutionary Party, became president of Mexico. The PRI was in power from the 1920s until 2000 and had many accusations of disappearance and violence against students. Enrique Peña Nieto's first action as president was to create alliances with Congress to push for reforms, most of them related to the economy. He invested heavily in cleaning Mexico's image abroad, running various editorials in world newspapers, and pushed security to a less prominent place than his predecessor. Yet, the violence continued. Not because you ignore a problem, it means it goes away. In 2013 alone, 23,000 people were killed. One out of three homes reported to have been subject to a crime, and even the government accepts that more than 90% of crimes are never resolved. On September 26th, a group of students was protesting on Iguala, the third largest city in Mexico's poorest state, Guerrero. The municipal government and the state government both belong to the opposition leftist party, PRD, Party of the Democratic Revolution. The local police came in, killed six students, and arrested the other 43. There is no record of the students in any jail. In the weeks that followed, 10 mass graves were discovered around Iwala. The mayor of the town and his wife ran away after a local newspaper showed the mayor's brother-in-law was a drug dealer. He was finally found on the 4th of November, hiding in Mexico City. While this crisis was going on, the president of Mexico decided to go on tour to China and Australia as they are important business partners. But it has been more than a month and he has yet to visit Iguala less than five hours drive from Mexico City. On November 7th, Mexico's Attorney General gave a press conference where he announced that according to some of those interrogated who showed signs of torture, they believed the students had been killed and burned. The parents refused to accept this information until reliable <coughs> DNA sources are presented. When he thought the microphone was off, he told his aide to end the questions as he was tired. Ya me canse. We stand here today saying, we are also tired. Tired of a government that cares more about macroeconomic deals than the security of its people. Tired of corruption. Tired of fighting a war on drugs that will only be solved when demand in the United States decreases tired of unsolvable crimes. The state has a responsibility to protect its population. We ask you to do three things. Write to your local Mexican embassy or consulate to demand justice. Attend local events in your area to create awareness. Spread the word. Mexican politicians cannot hide if the world is watching them. A mi hermanito enseñé Jugando en aquel patio en la escuela A mi hermanito enseñé Say the 
septiembre sucedió todo lo peor fuimos todos agredidos con armas por el gobierno opresor tirando a darnos directo a mansalva y mi hermanito cayó a un lado para podernos salvar los policías en cambio llegaban dispuestos a asesinar Okay, I'm going to introduce the four panelists now, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will be speaking. First, we're delighted to have with us Atenea Rosado Bjorkis. Uh, she was born in Mexico City, and she's currently a graduate student in international and transcultural studies at, teacher col at Teachers College, Columbia University in New York City. She graduated with honors in pedagogy from the UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And since 2013, she has served as an advisor to the state government of Colima State in Mexico, and also to the government of Haiti, in collaboration with the American Friends Service Committee. She currently serves as the vice president of the foundation A La Izquierda. And she'll be giving her remarks on the on the topic of the Rural Teachers College and colleges, as well as some background on the student movement in Mexico. Then we will hear from Camila Ruiz Seovia, who's also from Mexico City. Camila is a freshman here at Brown University, where she plans to concentrate in political science and where she works as a columnist for the Brown Political Review. She participated in the 2011 Movimiento por la Paz con Justicia y Dignidad, the Movement for Peace with Justice and Dignity, a mobilization of civil society against the drug war in Mexico. And she'll be focusing her remarks on the student movement in Mexico. Then we'll hear from Paula Martinez, also from Mexico City. Paula is a second year student here at Brown University, where she currently plans to concentrate in international relations and history. As I mentioned at the outset, Paula recently co-authored a fine piece with Camila uh, Ruiz for the Brown Political Review on Ayotzinapa. And Paula will focus her remarks on the role of the national and local state in the disappearance of the students. And then finally, we will hear from Janice Gallagher. Janice is a postdoctoral fellow at the Watson Institute for International Studies here at Brown. She recently obtained her PhD in government from Cornell University, and she previously earned an MA degree in teaching from Brown University. Janice conducted more than two years of field work in both Mexico and Colombia, and she previously worked as a human rights accompanier in Colombia. And her research focuses on the role of organized citizen action and mobilization and the effects of mobilization on judicial as well as human rights outcomes in Mexico and Colombia. And she will focus her remarks on Mexican and transnational civil society. Okay, so we're gonna begin with uh, Atenea. Would you like to come to the podium or give your remarks there, however you like? I, I prefer to sit down. Uh, yeah. But I will, thanks. Um, I have a presentation and it's, it is about eight minutes, and um, it's about the people we're going to talk about today. Uh, you will see the names of the 43 missing students. Um, I believe many times when we talk about the statistics and numbers, we forget names and we forget that they are people. They were people. Um, so these are their names. You will, you will see them. Uh, first of all, I would really like to thank Brown 
um, for inviting me and Camila, and Paula. Um, and I thank all of you for your interest. Um, along, I, I will read, and yeah. Um, along the next reflection, I will briefly describe the violence crisis in Mexico and how it has affected education for the last six years. I will focus on education. Um, I will focus on the tax to education, the disappearance of 22,000 people, according to Human Rights Watch, and the implications it has in the teaching profession and schooling in Mexico. Needless to say, this is an introductory presentation to the topic, and most of its purpose is bringing up some questions that may facilitate further research and actions. The disappearance and suspected killing of 43 education students from the Rural Teachers College Isidro Burgos in Ayotzinapa is not an isolated case, and more attention must be paid to Mexico, its teachers and students. In a country with 120,000 internal display people, 22,000 disappeared people and 121,000 reported deaths related to drug trafficking. According to the Mexican National Institute for Statistics and Geography, the need to ask how conflict has affected daily educational experiences is pretty evident. Today, 43 indigenous students from the Rural Teachers College of Ayotzinapa, the state of Guerrero, Mexico, are missing after participating in a protest and being detained by the local police. 22 policemen have been charged, more than 70 municipal authorities have been charged, 10 illegal mass graves have been found since September 19th, six bags where presumably the students' ashes are being analyzed and we're still waiting for forensic experts to confirm that the ashes belong to the missing students. This case is just a small sample of what has happened in my country for the last six years since the war on drugs was declared. According to Human Rights Watch, from 2008 to 2013, there were 22,000 people whose disappearance was related to federal, local, municipal, police, and government actions. While the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack reports 26,000 similar cases. At least 22,000 families who are still looking for their sons, daughters, fathers, mothers. Disappearance, in that sense, does not allow the community to heal because there remains hope and faith of finding the victims. Disappeared persons become a shadow of communities. They belong to our memory and remain in our minds. 43 students who wanted to be teachers. The teaching profession as well as schools have been a specific target since 2008. I believe that we are not we are not just speaking about 43 young men who disappeared and who were taken by the police, but we must acknowledge that they were going to be teachers and that they, um, they were active participants of their communities. Teachers are praised members of communities, especially, indig especially indigenous rural communities. They know what happens in towns. They are aware of who is whom. They can map power relations and function as catalysts of local empowerment. Teachers, perhaps, know too much about social dynamics. In the most recent report of the Global Coalition to Protect Education under Attack, the only source about education under attack and conflict in Mexico, Mexico and Colombia are the only Latin American countries where attacks to education have been constant. Since 2009, Mexico has had more than 500 attacks to school infrastructure teachers, students, university professors, or education personnel. 500 attacks to education since 2009. Armed criminal groups threaten teachers with kidnapping or other violence if they do not hand over a portion of their salaries. Schools may have also been used for military purposes. Secondary schools have been a place for recruitment for narco cartels and for, for the guerrilla. Teachers in more than 75 schools were threatened. More than 50 students, teachers, academics, and education officials were killed since 2008. In 2011, presumably a drug cartel placed bombs in six university campuses and threatened six others. In 2009 and 2010, there were numerous gun battles in the vicinity of schools, in some cases resulting in the deaths of students, teachers, or parents. Just as examples, 
In Reynosa, in 2009, 20 teachers reportedly struggled to keep up to a thousand students lying on the floor with their, ha with their heads down while, for over two hours, grenades exploded and classroom walls were peppered with bullets around them. These bullets were from the military. In 2010, Marta Rivera, a preschool teacher, calmed down her students, then four years old, singing while outside there was a shooting. Again, the cartels against the military. Since 2011, shooting lockdowns have been adopted by schools, so the kids learn how to be safe when their schools are being threatened. Last weekend, a shooting occurred inside the National University. The police in Georgia University student who was not armed. This is the third largest university in Latin America. It seems there is something specific about education that makes the sector vulnerable. Why is it that schools are being targeted by gangs and police alike? Despite education being a threatened sector, governmental and cartels attacks to the rural teachers' colleges deserve a specific attention. The Mexican state since the 1960s has generally abandoned rural teachers' college. These colleges have a long-standing tradition of political organizing and community engagement. In the 70s, Lucio Cabañas, a Mexican guerrilla member and rural teacher killed by the Mexican state as well, said, Los de Ayotzinapa, los de la Escuela Normal Rural, los metimos por todos los pueblitos y donde quiera anduvimos haciendo mítines. Incluso cuando estuvimos de dirigentes, dábamos ropa a los pobrecitos campesinos que no tenían con qué vestirse y se acercaban a Ayotzinapa. We, the students from Ayotzinapa, the Rural Normal School, the Rural Teachers College School, went through all the towns. We could organize rallies anywhere. Even when we were leaders, we gave clothes to the poor little peasants who have nothing to wear. They approach Ayotzinapa for help. So this specific teacher's college has a, has a history of a struggle. Teachers and teaching students are dangerous because they empower communities. In a country where 10 million of people are illiterate, the poorest population, those who teach how to read and write are dangerous. The case of the 43 missing teaching students is the top of the iceberg. But one must ask how many students and teachers have been internally displaced. We don't know. What are the implications for curriculum? We don't know. The Internal Displacement Monitoring Center and the Norwegian Refugee Council in its yearly review calculate that Mexico has more than 160,000 IDPs. Being the third country in the Americas with the largest amount of displaced people after Colombia and Guatemala. Mm. Nevertheless, Colombia and Guatemala have a larger history, have a, have a, yeah, have a larger history of internal displacement. People have displaced internally in Guatemala and Colombia for 30 years. And in eight years in Mexico, we have got 160,000 IDPs. The main reasons for people to internally displace and many times seek asylum in this country is violence between criminal organizations and security forces and the fear to force recruitment. We do not know how these students and teachers have adapted to their new residences. There is no plan by the Ministry of Education to attend IDPs, teachers and students' trauma, force recruitment in schools, violence prevention, peace building. There is no educational plan to protect education from attack in Mexico, to protect teachers, because there is no recognition of the specific threatening that education suffers. There are no reports on the issue from the Mexican government, and data is not available due to security reasons. All data presented here is from international organizations. There is less information regarding how violence has affected curriculum and teaching, even though there is no public policy regarding preparing school for attack. Teachers have had to teach children how to react to this kind of situations. Schools in Mexico are the place where children learn to read and throw themselves to the floor when there is a shooting. School is not a secure place where children can feel safe, nor teachers can feel safe. Being a teacher is not a safe profession in Mexico. How can teachers and communities explain conflict to children? How does the mental presence of missing individuals affect collective actions? How do we explain a conflict that does not have recognition as an emergency situation? It is through education that we can recover collective memory and promote truth and reconciliation. 
I wonder to what extent can schools advocate for reconciliations if there is no governmental acceptance of conflict. As an example, it took 90 seconds for the Mexican president Enrique Peña Nieto to explain what had happened in Ayotzinapa. Witnesses say that the bodies of the normalistas, of the, teacher, the, teach, the teaching students, born for more than 15 hours. Until Ayotzinapa, most international media had covered the Mexican war on drugs as an issue of the state forces trying to combat drug cartels and drug cartels taking revenge to civilians and disappearing them. On the other hand, communities find mass graves and see 43 students being taken away by the police. Is the war on drugs a strategy against drug cartels or against civil population? It's in this context that teachers must start thinking about restoring a culture of learning that does not include formal education in schools, but activities that force their reconciliation and community networks. Holding a spaces of deliberation and encounter is practicing the right of communities to know what is happening to them. It is also a method of healing and understanding that a part of being home of disappeared people, of in IDPs, of people who have been killed, Mexico can be a space for empathy, creativity, and solidarity. A culture of learning implies a culture of peace and caring for others, and that's dangerous. Schools are a fundamental setting for the reconstruction of this culture. There is, there is very, very few research on this. Um, it seems that not only the Mexican state and the international community have lived in denial of conflict <coughs> for more than six years, but also academia. The lack of knowledge about this field has direct consequences, such as the absence of security measures to protect the school, teachers, and students. There are many remaining questions concerning the war on drugs in Mexico and how it has influenced the lives of communities, people, institutions, and schools. There is knowledge and memory to be built. Most of Mexicans know a victim of the war on drugs, and we feel empathy. I'm going to finish here. The Ayotzinapa students, like most of you, were between 17 and 23 years old. They, like many of you, were university students. They, like many of you, believed in, an, in education. They, like many of you and me, wanted to help their communities be stronger. It is time for us Mexicans and the world alike to think about how they, nor the other 22,000 disappeared men, women, and children, and the 120,000 Mexicans killed since the war on drugs started in 2008 will never be forgotten. Thanks a lot. Okay. Next we'll hear from Camila Ruiz. So I'm going to leave that presentation. <laughs> yeah. Good evening, everybody. On my intervention, I will, covering this, I will be covering the student movement response to the events of Ayotzinapa on a national and international level. I would like by simply expressing my gratitude on your presence. Coming to terms with this event has been really hard for me, as it has been for the people in Mexico. A couple of days after I have learned that our students have been forcibly taken by the police and handed over to the United Warriors, I call a very dear friend from home. I was feeling overwhelmed and powerless. It was just very hard to believe that something so brutal could be happening home. Please remember, that the students of Ayotzinapa were training to become teachers of the most unprivileged areas of the country. Please remember that they were students our age, that they were completely innocent, and most importantly, do not forget that it was the state of Mexico who orchestrated the tragedy. My friend told me that the best remedy for, for pain was action, that crying was important but moving forward and start thinking about solutions was essential. This is why I'm very happy to see you here. There has been a great response for the international community that I really, really appreciate. Events, as this is teaching, matter. Acknowledging the brutality of tragedies like the one of here in Ayotzinapa may help us understand the world we are living in today and question whether this is how we envision our future. As students, we have the responsibility to start this type of political conversation. We have already talked about the violent scene that today is defined Mexico. The students of Ayotzinapa are among 20,000 who have gone missing since the start of drug war in 2006. The case of Ayotzinapa is one in more than 100 cases in which state authorities have participated in enforced disappearance, according to information of the Human Rights Watch. As violence occurs on a daily basis in Mexico, many back home have, start, 
regarding as something normal, as something that is inev inevitable. But is it really okay to feel afraid to walk in the streets at night? Is it okay to accept that I should avoid traveling to war-affected areas? Is it okay that journalists report our fear to report narco-related news? Is it fine that in a macho society like Mexico, violence is gendered? As tragic as the events of the Ajacinapa are, they have helped us to wake up from this illusion. There is no reason why fear should prevail in Mexican society. Fellow students and family members of Ajacinapa have come to lead a movement that goes beyond a single cause and brings together a society that is sick of its national situation. On October 8, after a number of small-sided protests, the students of Ayotzinapa led a large-scale demonstration in Mexico City. In streets, people carried candles, crosses, and photographed of the missing students. The phrase, a life they took them, a life we want them, was heard over and over as people were marching together. My family and friends were there. This demonstration brought a lot of international attention and support from, the, from Mexican and international students from many, many universities around the globe. Fellow students from MIT, Harvard, and Blake, Berkeley put up an amazing video where students from 43 nations showed their support. I invite you to watch these videos on YouTube. On October 22nd, there was a second large-scale demonstration in Mexico City, with replicas in cities inside and outside the country. On this occasion, students did not only demand for the reappearance of the students, but they denounced the state's full responsibility for the events. Mexico City has the largest, the third largest square in the world. There is the student's growth. Fue el Estado. It was the state. The image became one of the most iconic in the movement. During the demonstrations, many students posted their red. It could have been me. While I understand that this is just a gesture of solidarity, the horrible truth is that in Mexico, some people are more vulnerable to violence than others. This has a lot to do with the profound levels of social inequality that exist in the country. 6% of, of Mexico's total income is shared by the lowest 20% of the population, while 50% by the upper 20% of Mexicans. Those with less access to opportunities are indeed more vulnerable to violence. Chances are that if you are born in one of the poorest regions of the country, like Iguala Guerrero, you're more likely to be confronted with violence. If you're an educator, if you're young, if you're poor, you're a clear target of the drug war. By the way, the phenomenon of violence and vulnerability also occurs on a global level. Brown students, just by virtue of being here, we enjoy more security than the majority of the world. I don't believe that any human being has more right to be safer than another. Let us recognize our privilege and act accordingly. 43, 43 days happened, and the whereabouts of our 43 students remain unknown. Okay. Students called for a Global Action Day on November 5th, in which they invited the international community to study in solidarity. Participation from the international community has been essential in raising awareness of the event and pressuring the government to take action. Tomorrow, November 20th, Mexicans are calling for a national strike. Many universities and business will be closing down to stand in solidarity, and people will be marching again in the streets led by the family members of Ayotzinapa. Once again, the international community will be having actions to support us. Uh, as Richard Snyder has mentioned, we'll be also having actions here at Brown. I would like to finish my intervention with two thoughts. The first one is on fear and hope. Bonaventura de Sosa Santos, an important human rights activist and professor at Yale University, wrote a letter to the youth of Mexico. In this world, there are two emotions that dominate politics, fear and hope. Students of Mexico, please know that the events of Ayotzinapa are a pure act of violence, and they are aimed to cause resignation in society. They are aimed for you to become hopeless about the future. Those in power and crime know that without hope there is no social change. Please do not give up to fear. Instead, learn how to confront it. You as students are the carriers of hope. Do not forget this. My second and last thought is directed to the future of the student movement in Mexico. In Mexico, as in many other Latin American countries, 
our long-standing tradition of student movement has sadly reproduced the macho, authoritarian, and violent dynamics of our society. Ayotzinapa is giving us an opportunity to reconfigure our social movements. Ayotzinapa is our moment to advocate for a more horizontal, pluralistic, and peaceful political action. One that cracks down the, the tremendous social division of our country. One where everyone can participate regardless of their passion or profession. One where women are not targeted. One where every voice has the same value. This event has taught us that, the violence, that violence only breeds more violence. This is our chance to explore more peaceful dynamics. We ask the world to keep an eye on us today. Our pain runs deep. It keeps us awake. The truth is, however, that when they buried us, they didn't know that we were sticks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. First of all, I, like Camila, would like to thank you for joining us today at the teaching. The past weeks have been very hard for all of us. At the beginning of the demonstrations, living abroad when such important movements are taking place back home left some of us feeling quite powerless, frustrated that we couldn't be physically there standing in solidarity with our fellow families and classmates. Now, thanks to the fantastic cooperation and enthusiasm of the Watson Institute, the Center of Latin American and Caribbean Studies, Brown University, and most of all, thanks to the enthusiasm and socially uh, engagement of the student community that want to learn more about Mexico, this teaching has been made possible. The international support that Mexico has received in the past weeks has been deeply appreciated, and you are part of it. I am really grateful to all of you for being here today and standing in solidarity with us. In my intervention, I will be discussing the role of the national state around the case in Ayotzinapa. In particular, I would like to bring the following issue to the discussion table. Do the events of Ayotzinapa qualify as a state crime? Given that, as of today, there are still divergent views of the role, of the state play, of the role that the state played in the events, I believe that addressing this topic would be fruitful to, in the understanding of the complex situation that Mexico faces. In addition, as Janice will be talking about later, the definition of the events of Ayotzinapa as state crimes ha has been crucial in bringing together different spheres of human rights organizations. As I said, um, it is important to acknowledge that as of today, there are still conflicting opinions as to whether or not the events of Ayotzinapa constitute a crime of state. On the one hand, Several journalists and political scientists, such as Imanol Ordorica and Adolfo Gili, as well as Amnesty International Mexico, have identified the events of Ayotzinapa as state crimes, under the idea that they expose the long-established situation where the violence of the organized crime has been working under government's orders to repress social mobilization. On the other hand, however, there are some who have refused to label Ayotzinapa as a state crime, such as the European Parliament in its resolution adopted in October 23rd. In it, the European nations call for the comprehensive investigations and impartation of justice without impunity in Mexico, but refuse to directly blame the Mexican government for the disappearance of the students. What's more, there are also those who have rejected the categorization of the missing students as state crimes, accusing those who use the term as being intellectually dishonest, ignorant, or even trying to destabilize the country. In his conference on November 7, Attorney General Jesus Murillo Caram dismissed the argument that the attempts against the, that the aggressions against the students in Ayotzinapa were state crimes. In his words, it requires much more for it to be a state crime. Similarly, Maria Amparo Casar, researcher at the CIDE, a university and research institution in Mexico, presented this view in her column from last week, titled State Crime, published in the newspaper Excelsior. According to her, the events of Ayotzinapa do not qualify as state crimes because of two reasons. First, they weren't justified by the government as legitimate acts committed for the benefit of a greater good. Second, she says that when state crimes have been committed, all the branches and parts of the government have been involved, either by action or omission. 
Before I begin this analysis, it is interesting to note that Ms. Kosar herself establishes in another one of her articles, this one under the name, When Omission Becomes Complicity, that when it came to Ayotzinapa and the general violence rock in Mexico, quote, the authorities from the three government branches, their ministers, ministries and agencies, as well as the PR, PRD, the PRD. PRD, and the National <laughs> Human Rights Commission have been omissive and those accomplices. This one will be discussed later, but I would like to make it clear that she herself addressed this fact. First, I would like to look into Ms. Kassar's first point. There has been no justification from the Mexican government regarding the attacks against the students from Ayotzinapa on September 26. For this reason, she argues, the events do not constitute a state crime. Indeed, according to Argentinian late lawyer Raúl Zaffaroni, cited from the Institute of Juridical Research of the National University, where government discoursing crimes of state is concerned, it must have the following fundamental characteristics. First, it must have a justifying discourse from the government, where the state claims to not be confronting societal values or reinforcing them. And second, it must lead to the reverence of the criminals or, as heroes or martyrs, perceived to have unwillingly but inevitably committed massive crimes in the name of defending the greater good. The characteristics that I have cited certainly complicate the classification of the events of Ayotzinapa state crimes. Admittedly, there has been no attempt from the government to justify the disappearance of the students. And instead, several arrests have been carrying out against both the United Warriors and the local authorities that were polluted with the organized crime. Furthermore, the President and the Attorney General have readily admitted that these are barbaric acts. And they are a harsh blow to the nation and promised that the culprits would be punished. However, it is crucial at this point that we do not forget one thing. The state is defined as the political institutions that monopolize the legitimate use of force in a territory. Being from the government and the police force, the mayor of Iguala, Jose Luis Abarca, who ordered the attacks against the students in Ayotzinapa, and the police forces that abducted them and turned them over to the United Warriors are part of the Mexican state. Ayotzinapa, literally, was a crime order and carried out by members of the state in collusion with the drug cartels. This leads us to Ms. Kassar's second point. The crimes of state require the invo involvement either by action or omission of all branches and levels of the government. Ayotzinapa, she argues, does not fit this requirement. Amnesty International has indicated the negligence and complicity of the wider state with regards to the case of Ayotzinapa as well as in the rampant violence in Guerrero and the rest of Mexico for that matter. The fact that the mayor of Iguala had already been accused in 2013 of personally assassinating three activists in Guerrero, but no charges had been pushed against him, effectively identifies the heads of the Party of the Democratic Revolution, PRD, and the Attorney General of Mexico as complicit in the Ayotzinapa case today through their omission of action against the mayor. Moreover, the state's failure to process the denunciations related to the torture and murder of two students from Ayotzinapa, the same place, in 2011, at the hands of local and federal police again, further indicate a chilling precedent to the situation we live today. The state authorities knew about the violence presence in Ayotzinapa and Guerrero and did nothing. The involvement of the weather state by action or omission, as she, as Ms. Casar says, is not only present in view of the latest crime in Ayotzinapa, but has been true for many years. Thus, while the events of Ayotzinapa are admittedly lacking the element of justification from the government, the authorities from Iguala ordered the attacks against the students. This characteristic makes it a crime committed by the state, in the sense that the authorities involved belong to the political institutions that monopolize the use of force in Mexico. Furthermore, the lack of actions to punish the presence of violent behavior from the Iguala mayor in 2013 and from the police groups against the students from Ayotzinapa in 2011, indicate the omission and subsequent complicity of the larger state authorities in the perpetration of the attacks. In other words, Ayotzinapa shows the case of an attack against civilians and social mobilization, ordered by local state authorities in complicity of the wider branches of the state. For these reasons, in my opinion, the events of Ayotzinapa qualify as crimes of state. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Janice Gallagher will be the last four panelists. <laughs>
open here, but it's not like it. I know it's also on the desktop. Yep, there it is. Oh, it's too much. I think the lower case is mine. everybody so much for coming as um my other the other panelists have said um you're all really grateful um, for you making time in your schedules um in your lives to to think about um what's happening in mexico right now i feel especially honored to um, to join um this panel um as, as richard said i was in uh, mexico for most of 2011 12 and 13 working primarily with uh, groups of family members directly affected by the drug violence um, that we've seen under the calderon administration and especially with the movimiento por la paz uh, the movement for peace um, uh, which is led by poet javier sicilia today i want to talk about three different things first i want to talk about the fact that resistance to violence in mexico is not new Second, I want to talk about the new coalitions that we're seeing emerging as a result of what's happened in Ayotzinapa, um, which I think is actually a reason for hope. Finally, I'm going to talk about the implications um, of the United States. So in what ways is the US complicit um, in what's happened in Mexico? And what does that imply um, for many of us who um, have US citizenship and at the very least are, are living here currently? So first. Resistance to violence is not new. So a colleague of mine, Sandra Ley, and I um, worked together, and this is, and this is her work, um, looking at documenting all of the protests that have happened in response to violence in Mexico since 2006. I was prompted to share this slide specifically because I was listening to the radio in, uh, a couple weeks ago about what had happened in Otsinapa and in the US. And the, and the announcer said, so why is this the first time that we see Mexican civil society responding to the violence in Mexico? And that is not, simply not true, right? We've, people in Mexico have been, alzando las voces, have been raising their voices about what has been happening um, uh, in terms of the, the rising violence um, since it started, really, in 2007 and, and in 2008. So we can see here, this is when uh, Fernando Martí's son was kidnapped and subsequently killed here is the Marcha Nacional por la Paz. This is after Javier Sicilia's son was killed in, uh, in March of 2011. And here are the caravans for peace that the, that the Movement for Peace sponsored. So just to underline, these are, this is a, these are, not, these are not in some ways, unfortunately, um, it's not new that Mexicans are saying, people in Mexico are saying this is not acceptable and there's something needs to be done. And they were happening, these protests were happening throughout the Mexican state in, from 2006 to 2012. You can see, for those of you who are familiar with the map, those areas which have had the highest violence, Chihuahua, Guerrero, Nuevo León, um, are, also have, unsurprisingly, the highest number of protests. So people have been reacting. Who has been reacting? Human rights organizations have been reacting. Um, human rights organizations formed, and, I, and we don't, um, have the data, unfortunately, which shows the earlier protests, but human rights organizations formed um, largely in response to the Dirty War, in response to the student massacre of 1968, um, and they formed in Guerrero, which was, a f which, which was um, one of the, um, which is the state which the Dirty War affected the most. They formed in Mexico City, and they formed in the south, in Oaxaca and Chiapas, which were also targeted by the Dirty War. So human rights organizations have existed in Mexico since the 60s, 70s, 80s. And these organizations are, are um, organizing some of the reaction against the violence that's happening. Victims and their families, largely since um, the emergence of the Movement for Peace, have emerged in nearly every city and every state affected by the violence. Right. Sometimes these organizations are connected to human rights organizations, but largely these organizations have been mothers, fathers, um, spouses of those um, young men and women, um, sometimes not young, um, who've been disappeared, who've been uh, murdered um, during this uh, wave of violence. So they have been organizing sometimes small, um, but uh, significant uh, protests against what is happening. Finally, schools and universities, right? As, um, as Camila talked about, the student, um, students have been hard hit by this violence, and they have also been organizing. So, but just to, these um, protests were largely separately organized, right? Prior to what has happened on Yotzinapa, there's really different groups 
<coughs> excuse me, um, that, are, that are mobilizing and not necessarily together. I think it's worth highlighting the human rights organizations formed when violence was clearly coming from the state. And when we had this more generalized violence in which 70,000 people have been killed since 2006, in which the material and um, intellectual author of the crimes is often not clear. So I think a, a way of thinking about the violence since 2006 is that it's been a lodo. It's been a mud in which there's no state and there's no drug trafficking organizations. They've kind of mixed. So there's no water, there's no earth. They've mixed to become a mud of who's responsible for that violence. Human rights organizations have therefore not wanted to get too involved in what's happening because it's not clearly the state that's perpetrating the violence. And I think there's um, been some good critiques, um, but I organized, I um, interviewed the head of one of the most prominent human rights organizations who said, what we're good at is talking about state violence. When it's more complicated, right, when it's this, when the violence comes from this mud, it's more difficult for us to be involved. So that's kind of where we found ourselves before the Ayotzinapa um, disappearances. So who's responding, right? So that was who was organizing to violence before the Ayotzinapa um, protests. Now who is responding? Human rights organizations, local organizations, and student organizations. So these three groups that were organizing separately, we see them all becoming involved in the Ayotzinapa organizing. So Tlachinoyan, which is one of the, probably the, the most um, uh, prominent human rights organization, um, not only in Guerrero, um, but also in Mexico, um, has taken on the case. They're devoting their resources, their lawyers, to working on the Ayotzinapa case. Centro Pro de H, which is the largest um, uh, human rights organization in Mexico City, has hosted the, um, the, the fathers, um, the mothers, the family members of these disappeared students um, uh, at their at their, um, at their center. So all of these organizations, um, especially the human rights organizations, are coming together. This is a crime. This is a human rights violation that touches, that resonates with, with, the, um, with people who've been directly affected, who have a family member that's been disappeared. It resonates with students, and it resonates with the human rights community. So the opportunities for collaboration and a different type of organizing are larger than I think we've ever seen before. So, what does this mean for the United States? So the Movement for Peace, which we all have talked about a little bit, um, in 2012 uh, conducted a cross-national caravan. In 33 days, they went to 27 US cities, and they assembled <coughs> more than 300 organizations in the United States to work against um, the forces that had caused violence in Mexico. So over... Um, there was about 100 people that crossed the country and talked to all of these organizations in the US, including the NAACP, which is the largest organization of African Americans in the country. They were a key sponsor of this caravan. The National um, NALAC, which is the National Association of Latin American and Caribbean Communities, LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, um, former um, uh, members of the um, po former policemen and soldiers who had been involved in the drug war. So this. This caravan recognized that the causes of violence in Mexico are also affecting people in the United States, right? So it was tried to build a binational coalition to talk about what policy, what are the policies that are um, creating violence in Mexico, um, and what do those look like in the United States, and what can we do about them? So they focused on four different. Um, four different sets of US policies, which we can really see are driving the violence in Mexico. So the first and most important is drug prohibition. So there's no good numbers exactly on what portion of the um, of drug profits are coming from, um, coming, for example, from the sale of marijuana um, in the United States. But one number that is out there is that about 60% of cartel profits come from the sale of marijuana in the United States. What is certain is that the money that is supporting a lot of the violence um, comes from drug use in the United States. And that one concrete thing that we in the United States can do is start thinking about the decision to con consume drugs as a political one. Right? I'm coming from working in Colombia, where the most radical groups, especially groups of young people, have taken a really hard stance against the, cons against the consumption of cocaine, for example. It's very clear that consuming cocaine in Colombia fuels the violent conflict. 
I would ask us in this room in the same in the same vein to think about the personal consumption choices we're making, especially around um, around marijuana, which is kind of un we don't we don't think about um, as perhaps being linked to commodity chains which are which are supporting violence, and some locally grown isn't, but a lot of it is, right? So thinking through that, I think, is an important thing um, that we can be doing on a policy level. The changes in um, in drug policy in the United States are an important important part of, um, so questioning prohibition is something important that we're already doing in the US that I think helps um, what's happening uh, in Mexico. And I think it opens, it's helped foster a dialogue inside of Mexico about alternatives to drug prohibition. US military support. The US has given uh, about $1.2 billion to Mexico since 2008, <clears throat> most of which has gone uh, towards efforts um, to, uh, to eradicate um, the drug trade, um, and in some way has ended up in the pockets of the police and the military. I was in Mexico City at the U.S. Embassy interviewing the people who are in charge of spending all that money, and I asked them, so what's happened to all this money that's been spent, especially within the military? And they're like, well, we have training sessions, we buy, you know, we're helping to buy a lot of, a lot of um, uh, weapons, but afterwards, we're not really sure, right? So our tax money is going towards the military, is going is being funneled towards police departments, and the US has no idea how it's being used, right? I think that's something we really need to think about um, as US citizens, right? So we are, our money is implicated in the commission of violence, partially because um, it's really hard to buy guns in Mexico, right? Most of the guns in Mexico, again, this is really, these are hard figures to come by, but um, a lot of them are coming from the United States. It is legal currently to buy um, by the internet or at gun shows weapons along the border and then you carry them into Mexico. Nobody's checking whether or not um, you're bringing, you know, 100 semi-automatic weapons or 1,000 when you cross the border into Mexico. So this the way we've started to think about um, easy access to weapons being a problem in our own communities, it's a huge problem in Mexico as well. Finally, um, money laundering. So this money, not only are weapons flowing across the border, but, but money is too, and, and feeding the, the, the problems of violence. So I know that these are, these are larger macro issues, but I think, um, although Ayotzinapa is, is a key kind of wake up call, um, unfortunately, it is not um, the first time um, that we're seeing egregious violence happening in Mexico and um, in which complicity um, uh, with US, with, in which US policy is, is causal um, in, in producing those, those terrible events. So thank you all so much for coming. I appreciate your time. Thank the <clears throat> four panelists, and we're going to open things up for discussion and questions. And I'm going to take my prerogative as chair of the panel to throw out the first question. A number of you alluded to actions that people like those here today in the audience can take to get involved if they're moved by this situation in Mexico. I wonder if the panelists could say a little bit more about recommendations for those who are moved to take action, to do something. Yep. Okay. So to, to reiterate, and I think, again, the most basic thing is thinking about in our, in our daily lives, the fact that you're all here, not to oversell it, but really is hugely important. Staying up on what's happening, this, is, this produces a political cost to what's happening, right? That is the most important thing I think that we can do from here, is show that there's, there are people who care about this issue um, outside of Mexico, that our eyes are there. Um, that political pressure is really important um, for figuring out what happened to the students, as well as hopefully changing the patterns that lead to, lead to this type of violence. I think policy-wise, um, voting, uh, applying pressure to US policymakers to reverse some of the policies that are leading um, to a context in which, in which this violence is happening is important, and again, our own consumer decisions, specifically around the consumption of drugs or some <coughs> concrete things. And then we have, we have some actions on campus, for example. Camille, do you want to talk about this? Yes. Uh, Richard Alvarim talked about them. So tomorrow we're going to have an exhibit on the main green. Uh, 
we would really encourage you to come and to take pictures of the event. I think, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, thanks to international support, uh, we've been able to pressure Mexican government to take action on the events. So really, this global forum right now um, will be gathering a lot of, of photos, and it would be really, really helpful if you, could, if you could come tomorrow and take pictures. And just by spreading the word, it's just essential for us. Um, well, yeah, to reiterate, obviously the presence, raising awareness is something that is of vital importance, so thank you all for coming. However, um, I would like to encourage you not to keep it in the classroom. No, do not keep it here, but really, in addition to being active in the campaigns that are happening, in addition of like tomorrow's events that you guys should go, it is also about taking this, like the situation of the drug war in Mexico and applying it to your daily life. A lot of, um, it's, it's about cons consumption decisions and I would really like to invite you to become more aware as to where the marijuana that is around colleges in the United States, where it comes from, and really make some conscious decisions that that is fueling a lot of problems in Latin America, in my country. Hi everyone, I'm Julia Hernandez. Uh, I wanted to speak a little bit more about the event that's uh, been referenced uh, for tomorrow. It's actually more of an exhibit. It's in uh, going to be on the main green all day. Um, facilities will be setting up 43 empty chairs on the main green at 8 a.m. Um, with um, portraits of um, each missing student. Um, so like the panelists have said, it would be incredibly um, and powerful if you all could visit the exhibit um, and you know make of it what you um, get inspired. So take a picture, um, even if you, you know, bring something to the exhibit. Um, and just afterwards, keep getting um, educated uh, and be involved in like understanding what the crisis actually um, could lead to. Uh, it inspired me to think that there was a stronger social movement um, happening in Mexico. Um, and although it isn't new, um, it is again another, you know, I guess, curve on that uh, graph. And if it can continue, uh, it would be incredibly helpful. So, thank you. Great. Hi, um, I come from Venezuela, so we are all suffering as well um, consequences of violence and the drug prohibition. So, departing from a violence reduction approach, why? Um, what do you think, Janice, about um, transferring the drug issues from the judicial sphere to the sanitary sphere, and then starting to think about? De debating about legalizing drugs yeah. in the sense that um, studies from for example for example from the United Office from the United Nations Office on Drugs and Cr um, Crime shows that um, if cocaine would be legal would have the price of coffee but because it is illegal it has the price of um, gold and also it shows that um, people in Bolivia who grows cocaine only wins 2% uh, of the final prices. So there, is, there are a lot of people interested in having illegal drugs. So maybe move, uh, moving ourselves in order to ask debates for legalizing drugs or at least transferring them from the um, judicial sphere to the sanitary sphere, yeah. that would be, I mean, that would uh, at least look like it would change your things. Yeah. So I want to just say thank you so much for your question and your comments. We invite comments very much too. We, we all have specific experience, but we know that there's expertise and great experience here as well. So please uh, feel free. Um, so I will, so I'll, I'll respond kind of with the initiatives that I know that are happening around um, questioning this kind of drug prohibition paradigm. The reason we're calling it a drug prohibition paradigm is because most um, people who are, who've been in the U.S. a while, when we say prohibition, it, it immediately draws to mind 
behind the prohibition that the U.S. tried on alcohol, which failed miserably, right? When we, when we prohibited alcohol, we know it caused violence. We know that it didn't work. Um, and we, those of us who are thinking about um, questioning um, the prohibition on drugs, that's why we're using that language. I think the language on transferring it from the judicial um, sphere to thinking about drugs as a public health issue, I think, is the right, um, the right way to talk about it, right? So we know that um, people taking drugs, it can be bad for their health. It has a lot of, it can, has a lot of bad ramifications. But when we start thinking about um, the problem of that, the, that consuming drugs um, causes, and we think about it in terms of public health, I think it leads us to much more productive places. The UN General Assembly uh, has a special session on uh, reconsidering the way that we um, in the world um, uh, control and legalize drugs in 2016, and there's already a lot of great organizing going around, um, uh, going on around the world, um, and about how we can dismantle the um, judicial, uh, yeah, kind of the laws that we have around drugs, and kind of and do something more productive. So I'm excited about the the conversations that are going that we're going to have um, around the UN, the UN General Assembly special session in 2016. So if you haven't heard about that, um, uh, take a look. It's going to be happening in New York, um, and I think it's a great opportunity for. Um, rethinking and a great space to think about what policy change would look like if we're not just doing it in Washington State and Uruguay and in kind of country by country, but it's time to come together as a world community and say the drug prohibition is not working. It's um, making people poor. It's 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 leading to people being incarcerated at crazy um, rates and it's doing a lot of terrible things for our communities and let's stop. So thank you for the question. Did any of the other panelists want to respond to that? Okay, other questions or comments? Yeah, you. Yes, yes. yes. Sir. Um, uh, my name is Jose. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, information. I would like to point out to a sign that there was one of the uh, pictures of the video at the beginning that said, um, so many, Saquen esos sociópatas de aquí. Esa es la bendita cuestión. That's the, the, the question here. They're so fast. When you say about, when you talk about um, the um, about a social uh, political cost uh, raising awareness, there is a political cost. But when you're dealing with social classes, these are social as much as the people handling the money in the United States and European banks to come from these. Um, from, from this drug war, as much as the people that are here that are compli uh, complicit and they, they know about it, um, and the people all throughout Latin America that are just like taking advantage from the military aid to gain political uh, power and to gain mil uh, economic um, leverage in their own countries, you know? Um, these are sociopaths, and when it comes to this, we need to be thinking more about what's the political gain of doing this. And the political gain is what we've been saying, it's like raising consciousness to like when we when questions like drug prohibition come from, questions of like military or questions about banks or questions about what is the real structure of how the United States is exporting their problems, including this, including their pedophiles, with the mega laws, including everything, you know. What is the structure? What are the channels? And what is the need of the United States to do this? When these questions come in every like election, not election, when every like politicians don't do anything. When questions come <laughs> of, like whether organized and mobilized or not to, these are this is the political game that we we got this image of what's happening in Mexico that gets closer and closer to our perception, and gets closer to closer to like our. Uh, incentive to like do something about it. And that's the political game. That's what's going to do something about it. So, well, thank you for the the comment. Okay, other other comments or questions from uh, from folks? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, I just want to point something out that I think has not been spoken today necessarily, and it is the power of the social media. Like sadly, uh, in Mexico, the media is largely controlled, largely controlled by the government. So really, social media has a, a tremendous power. It's probably the single most powerful means of sharing what's going on. And like, so I just want to encourage you all to, you know, things as simple as posting a picture on Facebook. I mean, really, like, you know, to me, like, it may sound silly. You know, like, oh, like, what is a picture going to do? The reality is that in Mexico, like, the fact that the media is controlled by the government, in addition to all the violence against people who dare to write about, like, what's going on in Mexico, 
that really like many people don't really know what's going on, and I feel like that. Like, and I, I don't know if you talked about it. I'm sorry if, you, if I just missed that, but I think that's something very, very important. And like, social media has some power that I cannot even describe. Yeah, I, I, I can comment on that. If, uh, yeah, I think I personally believe a lot in the power of media, uh, in the power of social media. I think for the first time we have an opportunity to undermine state um, position, whatever they say, we can quickly go on social media and criticize it. Uh, I think uh, the role of social media was really important in Mexico during, during uh, the Jose 132 movement, a student movement in 2012. And I do think that media has helped a lot this movement to connect quickly. I think that the, the fact that this forum is being connected with many other forums in other universities already speaks about uh, the importance of the internet to bring people together for more actions. And, and I honestly believe that things as simple as a hashtag may uh, bring, like, put together a lot of information for people to learn more from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, like use social media, it is important. It brings people's perspective for the first time and it puts it on a first plane. So. Yeah, I could not agree with you more. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I feel that, and mm -hmm. I would like to agree with Camila and say that social media really works, but at the same time, I would like to encourage you um, to also talk to your peers about it. Do not just mm -hmm. take it into like, the social media. I think one of the biggest problems that have been happening, and as Atenea pointed it out, is that these are names and these are people. And these are not just figures, and these are not just campaigns that stay as campaigns. This should be something that let us have like real social action, like what have been what was organized today, the teaching, and tomorrow the commemoration. This is something that should be spurring more active mm -hmm. participation from the community. Yeah, just one last comment. It's just we should regard social media as a tool rather than as a concrete action. Let's let us use that tool as much as possible. Yeah. Okay. I, I, just to add, I think um, again, I, I work with a lot of uh, local groups um, who are kind of beyond Ayotzinapa, working um, in you know in Baja California, in in Tamaulipas, in um, Veracruz, in, in different Mexican states um, around the issue of disappearances. And often they don't have an office; they um, <laughs> might not be registered as a civil organization, but they are on Facebook. And I think what they want more than anybody else, they they put um, they're using Facebook, they're using Twitter to um, to diffuse to spread the images of those who are disappeared. So kind of so. They're, we're looking for people. We want to find them alive. They were disappeared alive. And so Facebook, if you're interested in what those groups are doing, um, they're not too hard to find on Facebook. Um, you can be my friend. I'm friends with all of them. Um, and connect, kind of connect if you're interested in what's going on in the different states. A lot of people are, come to me from different parts of Mexico and ask what's going on. The best information I'm finding is on the, on the Twitter feeds and on the Facebook mm -hmm. um, pages of groups, of local groups, because there's a very low um, barrier to entry. They can... They can be out there in, in an anonymous and safe way as well. Um, that's not true for, for a lot of the for a lot of the journalists. Yeah. So I mean, thank you. It's a really important point. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's very, very important we use it. However, we must remember that there are people in Mexico who don't have access to internet. Sixty percent of the population in Mexico don't have access to daily internet. So we we must be aware that these campaigns are very targeted to the middle social class in Mexico, the students, the people who know how to read, how to write, how, how to use Twitter, and that there are those who don't have any voice on this because they don't know how to read, they don't know how to write, they haven't had those opportunities um, to, to, to access to internet. Mm -hmm. There's you. a question here. Yes. yes. Sure. Thank you all so much for this I wanted to ask... Can you speak a little more loudly? It's hard to hear you. Oh, okay. Um, thank you for the teaching. I wanted to ask about the connection between what's happening in Mexico and then organizing of Mexicans who are living in the U.S. and kind of like the Latino movement here in the States and if there has been collaboration and what that looks like. Um, if you were talking about the ways that the U.S. is implicated and also like migration to the U.S. is very much tied with this violence. And I'm just wondering how that's, how that's being addressed. 
Yeah. Uh, well, I know that tomorrow, uh, for the national that for the call for a national strike um, in Mexico, there's going to be a lot of like replicas here in the U.S. and those are taking like those are being the the, the Mexican Mexicans living in the U.S. are the ones who are going to the embassies to take action. So they have also played a very important role at just trying to raise awareness of the issue in universities, but also in their local communities. I, I don't think there's been a separation at all. Uh, on, on the contrary, I think we have worked together quite well. But not only with Mexicans in the US, but actually with Mexicans in every part of the globe. Um, so really something that has bring us together, pain brings together, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, there's been an active participation. Yeah, I would also say that we are safe here that we can speak about this here. But people in Mexico, many people have been killed just for what they advocate on Twitter. And um, just to value the freedom to speak here. And that's why I think we are, we must be allies and we must get more people to talk about it because just by the fact that we can. Um, so, actually I could say that some, some things are being spoken here and not there. One last thing. Uh, there's a newspaper by the Mexican community in in the US. It's called El Beisman. And they have, yeah, they have really created a very great um, writing community. So yeah, there's many concrete examples of these kind of things happening. And it's just to look for them and to try to put them all together. Yeah. So, and I, I think so far, and correct me if you if you ladies think it's different. I think we've seen um, coordinated actions, mostly by university students, so far in the U.S. Right. So I think not most campuses, but a, a lot of campuses have had are having teach-ins. The the wonderful video that we that they showed we showed at the beginning um, was put together by students at different at different universities. At, I know I have friends at Berkeley, at U Chicago, um, at Columbia, who are all involved in doing things similar to this. I think partially because there's a rapid response um, ability because of because of social media, because we're all together, we get to live near each other and come together in places. In terms of um, so when, so Chicago and LA have. Um, um, the highest number of Mexicans in the in the U.S. and in terms of mass marches, I don't think it's happened yet. Um, and I think the organizations are talking about it, but I think there's still a. I mean, it's still pretty new. I think it's we're going to see kind of how it happens. And I um, I don't think we should think that those aren't going to happen. But as of now, we haven't seen um, kind of large marches, a la 2006 immigration reform, for example. Um, but I think it's kind of as I'm. I guess I've said what I think, right? I think that there's opportunities for new coalitions that are happening um, and that this has a lot of um, resonance. It touches a lot of people um, for one reason or another. So I think it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what we, what we see. Yep. Yep. So I have a similar question about organizing in the U.S. So um, I know that, especially about drug prohibition, uh, it's it's a long-term rule. It's like beyond uh, it's an APA, but uh, most of the people affected by incarceration because of the drug prohibition are communities of color, so black and Latino communities in the U.S. Is there a long-term plan? Like, uh, do you, do you see that there's in the future some sort of collaboration on people trying to like maybe vote more, uh, addressing senators and like addressing more government action to a lot like to legalize especially something like marijuana where if black Americans get like, ridiculous incarceration like uh, sentences over marijuana possession or sales and it's like kind of a connected it's, it's very connected between what's going on in Mexico right now and right. the war on drugs in the US right. so do you think there's a future for maybe working together between like communities of color here and Mexicans? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think um, probably the most one of. Thank you so much for that question. I think it's a really important one. I think one of the most exciting conversations I was a part of. Um, I was one of the coordinators of this of this caravan was between Michelle Alexander. So um, for those of you who think about um, about the drug war in the U.S., um, her her book, which is called The New Jim Crow, details how the um, the drug war has been used essentially as a new Jim Crow to create um, specifically to kind of um, 
relegate African Americans, especially African American men, uh, to second class citizens through the use of drug laws. Right. So, if those of you who don't know that book and are interested in this issue, I, I encourage you to, to to read it. So, she had a conversation with Javier Cecilia um, during this caravan, which I think so um, kind of. So I think that was there's there's motion towards uniting the struggles against the the drug war in both Mexico and and the U.S. And I think there's a there's a growing realization that the that the costs really are shared costs, right? So it's causing violence and militarization. So using the logic of the drug war, um, uh, we see the we see communities of color in the U.S. Um, being disproportionately affected by by violence. We see um, um, yeah the pernicious effects of the drug war permeating communities on both sides of the border. So I think there's definitely opportunity. I think that's why the NAACP signed on to this caravan. Um, in most of the border cities that this caravan went along, um, the focus was on um, having a conversation about um, um, at the with policymakers as well as with communities about how can we come together in a different kind of coalition than we've ever come together before. So it's um, within communities of color, it's also parents of people who've suffered from addiction, right? Mm -hmm. Who've been criminalized instead of receiving receiving health care. Um, it's family members and actual former policemen and and uh, members of the military who've lost their partners. So the, there's a great um, Neil Franklin is the is the president of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. He was a, a Baltimore City cop for um, 20 years and lost his partner on a drug raid. And after that was just like quit and and fa and, and led started to lead this organization um, out of this realization that it's just not working. It's not working in the U.S. and it's not working in Mexico. So I think there's a lot of movement towards that. Um, and I think there's great organizing that's being done and, and to be done um, around that issue. Other comments or questions from the audience? Yep, Jerome Marsden. Hi, um, again, thank you all for coming. Um, very interesting, and um, we all appreciate it a lot. I was wondering if the panelists could speak a little bit more about um, state involvement and how um, and human rights organizations' responses to it. Janice, for example, you mentioned that this is a muddy issue, and because of that, um, human rights organizations, many of them are more hesitant to get involved, especially the international ones. And I was wondering if you all could speak a little bit more about that. Uh, so, somebody, we were talking about the human rights watch, the Vivanco. Yeah. So, um, the director of the Americas Initiative of Human Rights Watch, Jose, Jose Vivanco, um, mentioned that even though there, there has been there have been many human rights attacks in, in violations in Mexico for the last six years. This was the the worst one because it was very clear that the state was participating in this. I think that um, as as Janice mentioned, many human rights organizations don't want an involvement because it is hard and it takes a lot of resources and these organizations do not have enough funding <coughs> if you are thinking um, if you are thinking on how to participate funding is another option um, so many of them don't have funding and they they pick very strategically what what cases they want to take mm -hmm. and this one is very 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 clear <laughs> that the that the local government uh, was participating <coughs> and that the federal government didn't react I, I mention it, but I think it is worth it. Um, the Mexican president spoke 90 seconds about this, and he hasn't said anything else. So there is there is omission, and it is pretty. I could say that it is very clear. This is the clearest case. I I would like to share an image that I was actually going to put up that I used. I think for the state movement in particular, it has been really important to point out this event as a state of crime. Um, just right here. Wait, sorry. So during one of the demonstrations here, um, so the students wrote in the, in the square in Mexico, Fue el Estado, and I think that's, it is really important to recognize this event as such because that's, that's the only way we can really kind of address it and realize how brutal it was. So it's just, I think for all 
the panelists here, we would all agree that is state of crime and yeah, we, we should just leave that very clear here. Yeah. Um, so I think um, Amnesty International has recently started to open um, centers within um, within Latin America. So I think there's there's a legitimate critique of kind of the big international human rights organizations that are located in the global north, um, and there's been significant movements in the international community to. Um, uh, to fix that, right? So I think Amnesty International, I've been getting a lot more emails actually in Spanish from Amnesty than in English mm -hmm. about the about what's going on in Yotinap, and I think that's actually a really positive um, positive movement, right? So the there's um, kind of new human rights centers forming in the global south, and a lot of them are are making a lot of noise about about the you know, Ayotinapa case. So I think that that's really positive. Um, I think we also see intergovernmental organizations have been activated. Um, so, for example, the Inter-American um, Commission on Human Rights has uh, agreed to um, play a consultative role on the investigation of um, of what happened in the OTNAP. I don't really know what that means, um, and I, hopefully that will will hopefully it will lead to something good. Um, I think the international community has, the international human rights community has been watching what's going on in Mexico. Human Rights Watch um, in 2011 put out a really important report about disappearances um, in Mexico. Amnesty International, when I was in these states, in the, especially on the northern border, that have been heavily affected, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights is there. The, um, as in literally representatives from that office are visiting these local small organizations, often which are um, victim-led and um, are the family members of people who've been victimized are the ones leading those organizations, and they're seeing what they can do. They're helping diffuse what's um, diffundir, um, helping to publicize what's happening. Um, so I think the, the international community is is has been there um, and has is kind of doing what we would hope they would do, um, given given this. But again, it's I think it's soon. Um, it's it is and it's it didn't happen very long ago, and I think it's still. It's, we're still seeing if this is going to be a game changer, right? We're still seeing if this is going to provoke um, a different level of response that's going to really help push through um, changes in some of the underlying uh, underlying dynamics. And again, not to hit it too hard, but this UN GAS, the UNGAS 2016, Google it if you haven't, this, um, this international forum, which is, so the UN is going to host this conversation about drug policy reform, and a lot of the human rights organizations are thinking about being involved, which is a big deal, right? Usually you don't think about human rights and drug policy reform, no, those are separate. But because of the, um, ex exactly the question that this woman here brought up about, so the UN, so the drug, the Drug prohibition regime is causing human rights abuses. And I think the UN, the, the human rights, insofar as human rights organizations are willing to kind of go to the root of the problem um, and be involved in this in UNGAS 2016, I think it's a really good um, and productive coalition um, and reframing of, of some of the, the real issues that are underlie what's going on. All right, so we're close to end at seven. I want to see if uh, S. Paulo or Athena, if they have any closing thoughts they wanted to offer with Janice and coming up to speak. <laughs> no mess. Is there anything uh, that you wanted to say at the end here? Or? Um, I guess I just wanted to thank you all again for joining us and also in live stream and for, I would really like to invite you to take this, what you've learned and what we've been discussing uh, this evening and not only get engaged more in the following movements that are going to happen um, at Brown and in the U.S. and back home um, for many of us, um, but also to apply it to your daily life. Yeah, I would just like to point out about point out what Paula, Carla, Paula said. Sorry <laughs> about the power of knowledge. Um, uh, these people knew things. These students knew things. These students were sharing what they know, and they knew how to read and how to write. And um, knowledge is <laughs> knowledge is very powerful. Um, and the same applies to you. Just knowing where your drugs come from is very powerful. Just holding ourser ourselves <coughs> accountable of 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 our daily lives and what we can know and what we must search, like where any product comes from, um, is very, very important. I would just 
would like to remind you that you know many things and that therefore you have power. And um, responsibility. And responsibility. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of responsibility. Okay, well thank you very much to all of you. Please join me.